with us. We often wonder who here is really better. But are we all made from the same lump of clay? Everyone should sit firmly anchored in the place where there is no better and worse. Your whole life long, you're completely out of your mind because you think it's obvious that there is a you and that there are others. You put on an act to stand out in the crowd. But, but in reality, there's neither you nor the others. When you die, you will understand. Buddha Dharma means seamlessness. What seam runs between you and me? Sooner or later we all end up acting as if a seam separates friend and foe. When we get, to, get too used to this, we believe that this seam really exists. Poor and rich, important and unimportant, none of that exists. It's only a glitter on the waves. Still, there are some who curse Buddha because they are stuck in unhappiness or because someone else is happier than they are. Happiness and un unhappiness, important and unimportant, love and hate, the whole world makes a big deal out of these things. The, wo the world where all of this doesn't exist, that's the world of Hishiro. There's nothing in the world we need to rack our brains over once it's clear that our deluded thoughts and discrimination, discrimination are absolutely useless. When the department head was sick, a subordinate jumped past him on the career ladder. He had been recovering, but with this, new, this news, his fever broke out again. You really don't need to get a fever over something like that. You say, I'll show you. Yes, you don't even know how long you'll live. Don't you have anything, don't you have anything else to do? In the West they say, man is the wolf of a man. The first step in religion must be that the wolves stop biting each other. What we've learned since our childhood days is nothing more than how to pretend we are important. The world calls it education. And what do we try to do later in life? We fight like demons, have sex like animals, and feed like hungry ghosts, like the hungry ghost. That's it. The whole world weighs on what we lack, like pushing others aside just to get ahead. In the Buddha Dharma, you shouldn't be so unfair. The Buddha Dharma means having success and failure. The mind of the Buddha Dharma is sitting in Sazen for aeons without achieving the Buddha way. People make sleepy faces if there isn't a fight or competition taking place. They are always wanting to gallop to the finish line. But is this a horse race? Or is swim like otters, wanting to be a nose ahead? In the end, they'll fight each other like little kittens over a ball of wool. When it isn't about winning or losing, love or hate, wealth or poverty, people put on sleepy faces. In the Buddha Dharma, it isn't about winning or losing, love or hate. Someone to show off with their satori. Yet, it's, yet it is clear that something which you can use to show off has nothing to do with satori. Okay. So, as this chapter of the, the chapter 7, the headline already says, um, this chapter is all about um, elimin eliminating your. Revivals um, with the purpose of being better than everyone else. Kudo Savaki talks in this chapter about the non existence of me or you or the seam which seem to separate one thing from another. And he also speaks about the addiction of the mind to entertainment like love, hate, wealth, or poverty etc. Um, and he shows us the uselessness of fighting to be the best or to get the biggest piece of cake because after all, all we gain from that is um, indulgence of no value and 
this will only cause for the de cause a desire for more of these things, for more indulgence. So the cycle, the cycle of being the best, attaining the things, attaining things, and the result of wanting more of of the things were attained is far from the truth. He says that the Buddha Dharma is the opposite. The Buddha Dharma is to have success in failure or to realize the seamlessness of everything. Um, he also talks about Hishiro in one quote, um, which uh, is an um, important concept in Zen Buddhism. I'm going to read the quote real quick again. Happiness and unhappiness, important and unimportant, love and hate, the whole world makes a big deal out of these things. A world where all of this doesn't exist, that's the world of Hishiro. So Hishiro is often translated as the thinking on the base of non-thinking. Um, so it's a state of mind where, where it becomes obvious that the ultimate reality lies be, beyond thinking. Um, and there was also a quote by Kudu Savak in this chapter where I can relate my own life very well to. Um, it's the one, people make a sleepy face if there isn't a fight or competition taking place. They're always wanting to gallop to the finish line. But is this a horse race? Or they swim like otters, wanting to be a nose ahead. In the end, they'll fight each other like, kid, like little kittens over a ball of wolf. So um, for a long time I, I noticed that, um, especially in the mornings, I feel very sleepy during sazen, um, when, when there's nothing basically to entertain my mind. And then I start getting sleepy. Um, as I said, yeah, that's mainly in the morning. Um, and it has to do with the, the fact that my mind um, just wants to get rid of the sensation of, of being tired. Um, so the only thing it can think about is going to bed again. Um, and that happens even if I have slept long enough. And that it used to be very hard for me to stay awake before sunrise. Um, my mind was very, very much in the habit of, of being tired in the morning. And then I was thinking back where this all started or where this comes from, because it doesn't seem to be normal. Otherwise, everyone would be sleeping during sazen in the morning. Um, so, and I, I traced it back to my school career, so to say. Um, so, I wouldn't really enjoy going to school that much. Um, so, I somehow tried to, the free time I had after school, I would try to stretch it as good as possible. Um, which would include like staying up very late, usually. And this, of course, made me very sleepy in school the next day. So often I would sleep during the first class of school. Um, and that obviously also wasn't the best for my enjoyment of school. So that always being in the search for something to entertain my mind um, developed. So I developed a very lazy act or my mind developed a very lazy attitude. And that habit actually has carried on until very recently, like only now, after a few years of um, doing meditation, I feel like I slowly get back the control over, over my mind and not caring too much if I feel sleepy or if I don't feel sleepy. Um, there's another quote in there which uh, I really liked. Um, it's the one... What we've learned since our childhood days is nothing more than how to pretend we're important. The world calls this education. And what do we try to do later in life? We fight like demons, as sex like animals, and feed like the hungry ghosts. That's it. Um, so I took this quote a bit apart because I felt there's a much a lot to say about um, the first part what we've learned since our childhood days is nothing more than how to pretend we are important 
Um, I really found this interesting that he says to pretend that we're important, which would mean that we're actually not important, that we're just pretending that we're important. Um, so I was thinking, what do we humans in society, in the Western society, value? What does make a human someone who is important? Um, so I found out that in the West, the Western idea of a value of a human being is for is different for males and females. For males, it's um, as a male you're valued for how much you have, simply like that. Um, but realistically, that's impossible because for every every millionaire, there need to be like a hundred and thousands of people who worked jobs which are underpaid. And for women. It's a bit different. Women are, are valued. Um, their value is measured by how beautiful they are. They need to be exclusively thin and remain perpetually young. But of course, realistically, that's biologically impossible. So the Western society values things which are, are simply impossible to attain. Um, but we humans, we still try to do that. Um, we're kind of locked in a hamster, hamster wheel and we don't realize that we're actually spinning freely. And, and that seems to be the problem of our society. So I think Koto Sawaki is very right when, when he says that we only know how to pretend that we are important. Um, for example, if we compare the, the key differences um, of someone who is important in the Western society to, for example, a Buddhist teacher, um, the characters, characteristics uh, of which make a Buddhist teacher a Buddhist teacher, um, which are, for example, generosity, discipline, patience, diligence, concentration, and wisdom, um, then um, I think that the, the Western society puts all its value on eternal wealth and beauty. Whereas, for example, in Buddhism, um, internal qualities, um, the, like the ones I said before just now, um, are important. So Buddhist practice is about shifting from, from pretending that we are someone who is important to trying to develop inner qualities um, which which lead us out of suffering. The next part he said um, is that we call this, this thing education. So I also thought about that, um, how, how it is in our society. Um, and I felt that my whole school education was always built around final grades and uh, grades in general. Um, and that all had to do with, with the struggle to enter university later on. Everyone wanted to go to university in order to um, get a well-paid job later on. And then being able to, to, if you get paid well in that job, which everyone is hoping for, um, then you spend that good payment on things which don't seem to have any real purpose whatsoever. Um, Yeah, I've noticed that in, in myself many times before um, during school that we are very pushed into that direction. Um, so, and then the payment, usually what I said before, males would then spend it on status symbols like uh, fast cars or, or big houses or something very expensive. And women usually would spend their money on things which would benefit their, their beauty or their overall phys physical appearance. <clears throat> so I think during school we are educated to be smart enough, but not smart enough to do our job, but not to, to realize what we're doing. Um, and the last part he talks about is, and what do we try to do later in life? We fight like demons, have sex like animals, and feed like hungry ghosts. That's it. 
And that's something I noticed not only in the West. Um, basically, every country I've been to seems to function like that. Um, and also, like every every culture around the world seems to have like some recipe for immortality. Um, there's, for example, reincarnation, which is literally uh, immo the recipe for immor immortality. Or it could also be just symbolically like um, the fastage of our identity so it will persist over the time nevertheless um, what do I mean by by literal immorality it's for example doing good deeds in this life to be either reborn in paradise which could be for example Christianity or to be at least reborn as a human being after death uh, for example in Hinduism we have that um, and what's meant with symbolical immortality it's something um, I've been speaking about before it's like writing books getting children building pyramids or just simply having a lot of things having a lot of money um, because and that's all happens because we as humans we are motivated to have a lot of stuff because it, it gives us this psychological sense of um, that we are able to live forever um, although um, we are ignoring something very important um, by always getting more and more stuff and trying to live forever and that's the that's our, these are the three fundamental truths, um, namely what impermanence, emptiness, and emptiness. So we as humans we try some to to create something which is permanent and constant and which makes us forget that we we are gonna die one day. And that's basically what creates the third tr um, truth, which is suffering. So, as humans, we, we try to solidify, solidify the sense of immorality and permanence day by day, more and more. And, and that leads to, to uh, neuroses like anger, hatred, sadness. And the most prominent one is greed, um, in my opinion. And that greed has, has a consequence of what Kodos Avaki is talking about um, when saying we fight like demons, have sex like animals and feed like the hungry ghosts okay so much from my side for me today are there any questions? Um, I think in the beginning you talked quite a while about the difference of faith in um, Christianity and Buddhism. Mm. In Christianity we have faith in God and Jesus and the salvation through Jesus. Can you say once more, uh, put it in a nutshell, what in Buddhism faith means? So faith is, is um, something um, faith basically means that we know that there's a way out of suffering which carries our practice um, so faith is like like, like something uh, actual knowing that, that we, we don't hope for anyone to, to give us salvation, but we know we can achieve it for ourselves. We know we can achieve it for ourselves because... Why? We have experienced 
something or where does that faith come from that there's a way out of suffering imagine somebody who's saying well life is suffering my life sucks I want to get out of that and I hope that so then takes me out of that but I'm not sure where does that person get the faith from that practice actually will lead him out of suffering Well, I only can talk about my, my own personal experience. Um, um, that through the practice of Sazen, well, in the beginning, I certainly didn't have as much faith as I, for example, have now. Um, that all these things which, which uh, for example, Dogen talks about are true. But the more, the more I follow this, these teachings of Buddhism, the more faith I got. So in the beginning, it wasn't really... I wasn't really sure and there was a lot of doubts but the longer I, I practiced the more faith I actually gained because it, I saw what what they were speaking about actually turns out to be true the longer I practiced so and I guess that's what many people struggle in uh, when they first encounter Buddhism to actually fully give faith into something which um, well they don't really know if it's true or not so, but then again, um, you still need a certain faith in order to, to start to try it. Otherwise, if someone has no faith at all into Buddhism, why would he actually try it? Um, where this faith originally <coughs> comes from, like, like before I even tried it for the first time, I don't know. Maybe it was just interest rather than faith. I personally, I thought uh, this definition that Sawaki gives, uh, where is it, to become pure, ah, faith means being clear and pure, that's the beginning of the third quote of chapter 29, and I think there um, Sawaki Roshi is quoting some part of the Bodhi, uh, Abhidharma, um, so you might know or might not know. In Buddhism, there's these uh, three, how are they called? Um, how are they called? Three baskets, I think. The three baskets. Well, one basket are the sutras, one basket are the precepts, and one basket is the, the Abhidharma, the, the kind of commentaries and the philosophy surrounding the sutras. And according to, well, the official uh, teaching, the sutras all come from the mouth of Buddha, which is, isn't true historically, but um, the sutras all come from the mouth of the Buddha as the precepts, but then the philosophy around that or the commentary around that, that comes from the monks who lived after that. And Abhidharma is, is this basket of the philosophy, the commentaries. And... Um, so there's also already in the Pali Canon there's the Abhidharma so, so there's this Abhidharma philosophy that's more than 2000 years old and I think uh, that quote comes from that time faith means clarity and purity um, so the way I take that is uh, in Buddhism faith means not to believe in something that might or might not be different from what other religions believe in but it's more um, the posture or the act of letting go including all of the beliefs so so that's how you reach clarity and purity so, I mean, what, what you said today isn't wrong. It's just that it sounds like a little bit like, um, hey, you're in suffering now, and uh, I understand that, but there's a way out of the suffering. Uh, you just have to need, you just need to have faith in that and, and, and practice with a faith. And, and that could be just like when well, in Christianity they tell you Jesus is going to save you you just need to have faith in that or uh, in, in the 
Nichiren sect in, in Japan, they tell you, well, the Lotus Sutra is going to save you. It's just that you need to have faith and you chant Namu Myoho Lengekyu, Namu Myoho Lengekyu, and then eventually you're going to be saved if you do it with a uh, faithful spirit. And I think that's not meant when Sawaki says means being clear and pure, it means to let go of all these beliefs. And become, well, it becomes sober, he says in other parts of this text, which we're studying in the winter. Become sober, um, or it's, it's exactly the same point that Dogen Zenji comes back to over and over again in the Monkey. For example, right in the being, there's this monk who's carrying this box with relics of the Buddha with him and he's doing prostrations in front of these relics uh, three times a day or whatever and his teacher says stop it and that monk certainly must have great faith first that he believes that whatever is in this box must be relics from the historic buddha and he also thinks that there must be some virtue coming from the prostration and still the master tells him well stop it and and the the monk doesn't want to listen, so the master tells him, open the box, and then there's a snake in there. Um, and the monk finally wakes up. But even if there wouldn't have been a snake in the box, maybe there wouldn't have, there might have been some bones in the box. Maybe it's chicken bones, maybe it's actually the bones of the Buddha, who knows. Um, even then, um, faith means to let go of this idea, well, these bones must be precious because they come from India and they look very old and somebody told me they're the bones of the Shakyamuni. Even this very devout form of faith is something that we need to let go of because it's something that what we add to reality, we're already in the Dharma, like we're already confronted with the three noble truths, suffering, impermanence, and non-substantiality non are those the three, and I think. Pardon? Impermanent suffering and emptiness. Emptiness, yeah. So non-substantiality non or emptiness are basically the same. So we're already in there. We don't need to add anything to it. We don't need to add anything to that. So, so in faith in Buddhism is not something that we need to add to our practice or that we need to add to reality but it's more of letting go of all these additions that we already made and all of these things that we already constructed to somehow help us to deal with this reality of suffering impermanence and emptiness but rather let go of these constructions and See suffering for what it is. See impermanence for what it is. See emptiness for what it is. That, that's how I kind of read this uh, chapter. Faith means being clear and pure. Um, well, later he talks about this... Um, that we all want to get excited by faith. Where was this? That some people... Well, here he says, the pure clarity in, the, in which the mud settles and excitement calms. It means nothing besides completely coming to, us, to your senses. Um, but then there was also this quote about people thinking that having faith means some kind of excitement and some people when they can't get the excitement, at least they pretend to be excited. Anyway, um, like the other day I was giving a talk in Chigenji as I do every month and 
At that time, we did a little zazen there during the talk, three minutes. Um, and I do the same often when I go to, to Osaka or Tokyo and give talks at, at culture centers and stuff like that. So we're sitting there for only three minutes in a chair. And of course, I don't want to waste half an hour or so in explaining what the Zen is all about. But, but still, I want to give people an idea of what they're doing during these three minutes. Mm. And what I said uh, at that time, a week ago, um, probably probably today is kind of the last day of the, of the January is a sumo tournament. Um, usually during this um, January Suna tournament, which is the first Suna tournament in Japan, there are six during the year and they're all 15 days long usually on the middle day on the eighth day uh, the japanese emperor comes to watch sumo so uh, he comes only once a year which is usually the eighth day of that uh, sumo, sumo tournament and uh, except for the fact that the emperor is there and watching and nothing changes so so it's the same procedure as always, there's uh, so many bouts, and uh, in the end, the, the Yokozunas compete, and there's the so called Gyoji, uh, this kind of Shinto priest uh, that's deciding who wins and who lost. And mm, so basically what happens during the Zen, uh, if you sit for three minutes or if you sit for 30 minutes or if you sit for th three hours, it's, um, it's a little bit different, but more or less it's the same story. You can sit for maybe 10 seconds being perfectly concentrated. But then after 10 or 20 or 30 seconds, there's some thoughts coming up. There's something coming up. Um, your mind goes either this way or the other way. Um, so uh, what I asked the people um, after the three minutes was first, um, well, Dogen Zenji um, says just sit and that's already an expression of enlightenment. And that's the saying in Soto Shu that um, one inch of Zazen is one inch of a Buddha. So three minutes of Sazen makes you three minutes of a Buddha. Um, who of you could actually, how do you say, prove that? Uh, could you actually, how do you say, reconfirm that during these three minutes? That three, three minutes of Sazen makes you three minutes of Buddha. Uh, so please, those of you who could confirm that, please raise your hand and nobody's raising their hands. Um, and then I asked, um, is there maybe anybody who felt that during these three minutes of Zazen, he was even less of a Buddha than he usually is, that he was even less of an, even more of an ordinary person than he usually is. And I was actually expecting some people to raise their hands, but also nobody raised their hands. So basically most people said it's was business as usual these three minutes. I didn't feel especially more of a Buddha, but I didn't feel more <laughs> deluded either. Um, I was hoping uh, for people to raise their hands because that's what often people tell me um, after the Zen that they had so much more thoughts and emotions and, and stuff coming into their heads than usual. Uh, that's also something that uh, Sawaki Roshi comments about in this book, no, not in two days text, but in some other text. That, um, often in the Zen, we are much more aware of the craziness of our minds than when we're sitting there with our iPhone and watching something on YouTube or we're busy do doing a task, we're cooking and it's close to 12 o'clock and we're not uh, sure if we will have lunch ready in time. Or we're sitting under a tree on a hosan and 
everything is fine. But then you're sitting on the cushion and you don't feel as you would wish you would feel and your mind is not in the state that you would wish it would be. And well, what Sawaki Roshi says here in this book is like when you're drinking sake and dancing with a geisha and there's a buck biting you on your testicles. There's some bugs sitting on your testicles. You might not even realize it because you're so drunk and so happy to be with that geisha at that time and you're in the dance hall. And now imagine the same thing is happening when you're doing zazen. The, the bug is biting you on the testicles when you can hardly sit there on the cushion with the bugs <laughs> biting on my testicles. And that's, that's basically happening uh, to our mind. So when we do zazen, mm, often we're even more aware of that we're no way Buddha, that, that, that how ordinary we are and how ordinary, ordinary our minds work. Um, and when we're sitting at home watching TV or on the internet, then we're already used by this ordinary mind, so we don't realize it, so how we're being used by the mind. While uh, in Zazen, it's just like the, the, the Japanese emperor watching sumo. Um, there's a fight going on there and the wrestlers, both of the wrestlers want to win. And both of the wrestlers doing their best to win. And the one who eventually wins might be happy. They don't show it because they're sumo wrestlers. They don't show wow. But, but they're probably happy if they won. And uh, the ones that lost also... Uh, they probably tell themselves, okay, tomorrow I'm going to do it better. Um, and that's what happens when we do the Zen. There's this old karma from uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, 10 years ago. That guy said something to me that uh, when I meet him next time, maybe in five or 10 years, if I ever meet him again on the street, I'm going to say this and that to him. Even stuff like that occurs but uh, and you see these thoughts coming up and you see this kind of sumo wrestling going on there inside yourself you and your rival um, the things you did right the things you did wrong and then sometimes uh, you remind of yourself that right now it's not time to do sumo wrestling and then you try to play the the gyoji the the, the the referee there and, and, and tell people to calm down or you judge your mind and tell, try to tell yourself which are okay thoughts to have during the Zen and which are thoughts you shouldn't have. Um, and then there was um, this um, thing that happened about oh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. The prime minister at the time, was uh, his name was Koizumi. He was pretty popular in, in Japan at the time. And uh, he also, the Prime Minister also sometimes comes to see the sumo. And there's this Prime Minister Cup. So there's one tournament where at the end of the tournament, the Prime Minister gives the cup to the winner. It was this tournament where one of the wrestlers was injured, one of the Yokozuna was injured, but still... Um, he made a big effort and fought and actually won the tournament, although he was injured. And the prime minister, at the end of the uh, tournament, he said, Kando shita aliato, uh, which means, Kando shita means, um, you really moved me. So, so that's, that's, uh, your performance really moved me. Thank you. Thank you. And he gave him this cup. And that became a big news in Japan, that the prime minister... <clears throat> showed how sumo had moved him and that's kind of the 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 kind of faith that sawaki says is what many people mistake for religious faith so you're doing the zen and you hope that it will somehow move you or you will have insights there you will feel better after it 
And basically what I said two weeks ago, rather than the sumo watching that the prime minister did at that time, you should first learn to take the position of the Japanese emperor. Basically just watch it without, the Japanese emperor never comments on sumo later. And, and um, sometimes they call it mono-i in Japanese when the gyoji referee declares somebody a winner but there's some other big wig sitting around this i think five or so um, ex wrestlers sitting around the ring and if they think that the decision is wrong they can raise their hand and say mono e which means basically i'd like to discuss that so then these five big wigs come together and there's also video evidence and somebody from the video evidence room gives them information over their uh, ear stuff. Uh, they have this headset on and then they discuss it and sometimes the decision is overturned and the other guys declare the winner or sometimes they have a rebound. Um, but even if the Japanese emperor is sitting there, nobody would think of asking him, how did you see it? So... Faith, having faith in the Zen means you just see it, just let things be, let them develop as they are. You're sitting there aware, but you're not moved by that. You don't get emotional about it, you don't judge who's the winner, who's the loser, you, loser. you don't identify with one of the wrestlers, you don't even identify with the referee, but you just sit there and let things develop. And the, the reason why often people think that during the Zen they're even less of a Buddha than normally is because they think they're responsible for the mess that's going on on that sumo ring, uh, rather than realizing that the fact that you can see the mess as a mess and you realize, oh, that there's, there's a mess going on up there on that ring, is because you're finally getting off the ring and you're finally able to see karma as karma rather than being already used by your karma. So I think that's uh, that's basically what he means there by faith means pure clarity. Uh, it means nothing besides completely coming to your senses. In which uh, he says the pure clarity in which the mud settles and the excitement calms. Although in Zazen often the mud doesn't settle right on the spot and the excitement can continue for hours and hours. Uh, but even if the mud is still there and the excitement is still there to just realize, oh, there's mud there and the excitement is there, but it's not my excitement. I don't need to get excited about the excitement. Then that's, I think, already the, the faith that Sovaki is talking about. Yeah, so that's basically my my feedback. Um, it's not that any of the stuff that you said today is wrong. It's just that faith in Buddhism doesn't mean that we have belief in some other truths than, than Christianity, like, like the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path. And um, if you can't... If you don't know them all by heart, you're not a true Buddhist or so. That, that's not the kind of faith that we're talking about. Any more questions? no one has a question I mean um, from tomorrow it's probably going on like this uh, everyone has two or three chapters per day hmm. so I mean you can decide how you want to do it uh, like today Fabian 
uh, he read the whole chapter, which is probably a good idea, but then he gave a more or less general talk about the whole chapter. You can also, if you want, prefer that, concentrate on two or three quotes that struck you most and say, for me, the spirit of the whole chapter is best expressed in this one quote or this quote stuck with me the most. So I want to dig into this one, which will also, you can't do that with all of the quotes. You can't do them one by one and then comment on them one by one as you would do with the Zui Monkey. But you could say, well, here there's uh, two dozen of quotes and these three I want to concentrate on. It will also a possible possibility to, rather than have a kind of general talk about the whole thing. Because are the topics of the of each section are they done completely by the editor, or did Uchiyama have any involvement with kind of grouping them? Um, I could imagine. Well, oh, I'm sure that Uchiyama had a look at the edited manuscript before it was published, and probably also gave some feedback. So. Um, it's probably written in the foreword. Um, Uchiyama Roshi took notes when he was studying with Sawaki Roshi, and basically all of these quotes come from his notebook. Mm -hmm. And he gave that notebook to a student, uh, Kushiya Shusoku, and he's the one who arranged these quotes into chapters following his well, inspiration or his common sense. Um, so it's not that the quotes that belong in one chapter were all said in the same context or uh, that there's any kind of, how do you say, timeline that the, the first quotes are the earliest ones and the last quotes are the last ones. It's just uh, that uh, Kushiya Shusoku thought these belong in one theme group. Um, and I'm sure that Uchiyama, well, read through the whole thing and gave his, his okay to it. Mm -hmm. The titles are also uh, from Kushiya Shusoku, so he decided for these titles that all start with to you, mm -hmm. to you something. We do go one by one commenting because that's what I've done mm. so far in my Samara. So it's probably too late to sort of restructure it all. Well, it's okay, but if you come, go try to go in depth with each of the quotes, then we sit here forever. <laughs> mm, okay. I mean, just reading the text alone takes some time. So if you wanted to give each of these quotes five minutes of time then probably alone that alone would have two or three hours mm. if on the other hand you talk only for 30 seconds about each quote then the question is well is it really necessary to talk 30 seconds about each quote or would it be not better to talk maybe 10 minutes about a quote that you think is really worth it mm. commenting on Say. Hey. 